my turn to do the introduction. Hello fellow letter crafters from around the globe, Serge Falcon here, also known as Bigfoot, and as I announced it on the last clip, uh, we're going to talk about leather. Is that good enough? Yeah, that'll do. Leather, a term used for a wide variety of different materials with different consistency, different finishes, different ways to make it, different animal origins, so one can simply not expect it to be as homogenous as plastic or paper. So each skin is different, and for starters, let's have a look where all this material comes from. We may all know that leather is made from animal skins. They are a surplus of the food chain, and therefore animal husbandry is the main provider of this precious raw material. The vast majority of hides in the leather industry are from goats and bovines. Then there's also pigs and sheep, much rarer are horse hides due to their high irregularity in thickness and density, but also for cultural reasons. Even chicken feet get tanned to make exotic looking watch bands. Depending on the culture and location, there are also other kinds of domestic animals we may not think about spontaneously such as ostriches, camels, or llama. The kangaroo also has been integrated into food chain. Its leather is particularly solid despite its relative thinness. Reindeer are a major domesticated food source to many circumpolar ethnic groups. Wild living animal skins are also made into leather, though to a lesser extent. Antelopes, deer are common, but I guess bear leather, it's much harder to come by than, for example, buffalo. Well, there's many more wild living animals that have their hides turned into leather, but I can't draw them all. Some may not know it, but fish have skin too that can be tanned. Salmon leather has been used since the dusk of humanity by circumpolar ethnicities. Stingray or shark skin also provides a source for the production of exotic leather and has been used since the antiquity. Then there is a whole range of amphibians, reptiles, such as snakes, lizards, iguana, and whatnot, that aren't in the food chain as such, except locally in some places. Alligator, on the other hand, is farmed not only for their skin, but also for their meat, though some say it tastes like chicken. Or is it that chicken tastes like alligator? Well, to keep it short, Potentially all skins and hides of the whole inventory of Noah's Ark could be used to make leather. Each kind of animal has a skin with its own characteristics that can widely differ from one species to another. Personally, I stick to goats and cows, always keeping in mind the preciousness and uniqueness of each individual animal. But even then, each hide, skin or leather is unique as we will see in a second. The animal origin can be determined by the arrangement of the hair follicles, that's those little pores on the surface. They are typical to each kind of animal. We won't go into exotic animals or the arrangement of their scales, for I consider them as show-off leather way out of my range of interest. We've been breeding cows for at least 5,000 years, so you can imagine that they come in all different sizes and shapes, and currently we have about 800 different breeds of cows, each with their own characteristic. Every individual has its unique DNA code that never was there before and never will be there after. Consistency and structure of a skin is influenced by gender and age. Many causes can influence the development of an individual during a lifetime. Disease or bad treatment can have a permanent influence Food is the key to a healthy development, but it can be altered by additives or hormones that aim for an increase of production not necessarily optimal for the natural development. Some things can leave a permanent scar in the skin, such as parasites or injuries with barbed wires, thorns, dog bites, branding, and all kinds of other owies. The local climate and also seasons of the years have an impact too. Skin structure can differ depending on the seasons an individual entered or exited life. Ethics hits a wall as soon as living beings get treated as things or simple commodities. The agro-industry has created life conditions that cause a general uproar. I won't need 
to draw you a picture of how life conditions can be diminishing not only life quality, but also the quality of this precious hide so it could turn into leather. Well, actually I just did. In my country, for example, there are strict rules about animal husbandry. Feeding lots, there is no such thing. As to hormone treatments, well, that's against the law. And uh, the animal protection actually managed to get quite some strict rules about how to treat animals. There's always the exception that confirms the rule, but the majority of our domestic animals have a better life quality than millions of people on our planet. And believe me, as a leather worker, I can see and feel the difference. Well, this one worked out. Cool. So, allow me to speak my mind a little more freely about my thoughts uh, concerning leather. As leather workers, we should keep in mind that the piece of leather that we have here probably is the only remains of that living creature there once was. So, we should treat any leather with respect, not to be wasteful, because we have the chance to give it a second life through a valuable and long-lasting object. It will have its own story too. And there's more to it than just the economic value. That is why I have a problem with this mentality to pop out lots of cheaply made articles and not very comfortable with that thought. Or do you really want to embrace that mass production mentality of a consumer oriented industry you despise so much as an artisan? Or would it be more acceptable to give it a small piece of your soul to it on its journey as something well-made and long-lasting? So modern nature provides us with a great renewable resource. But natural leather? It sounds like an oxymoron. There's no leather in nature. Or could you tell me on what tree it grows? Well, yeah, actually, that's true. There is no such material as leather in nature. Uh, we got the heights, we got the tannins, we got all these products that are taken out of nature, but turned into a non-existing material that is man-made. Actually, it is the first man-made material come to think of. Hmm. I'd love to make another infograph about how leather is tanned, but it's just way too complex. Instead, have a look at this link up here. Uh, it's uh, the Herman Oak Tannery in St. Louis, and they'll show you how they make their leather. Other than that, do a little bit of homework and check also on the links here below. So there are so many different tanning procedures and tanning recipes, just as diverse as all of these well-kept family secrets of grandma's apple pie that doesn't taste like any other apple pie in the world. Pfft, buying leather starts to be more complicated than just getting a simple cup of coffee at Starbucks. Leather can come as hard as a plank, or as soft and thin as a rag. For leather carving we use crust leather, that means it's vegetable tanned leather with no surface treatment or color or dye. If we take leather that hasn't been colored, vegetable tan would be kind of beige, tan, skin colored. Chrome tan on the other hand would be kind of grayish, bluish or greenish, pale green, but you won't find it undyed on the market or very hardly. Chrome tan is also very elastic, has got a little bit of a rubbery feeling and is a little bit fluffy. And usually it's already colored and dyed and it comes in a huge range of different colors already on the market as is. A dead giveaway for chrome tan is this grayish edge it has. Some may be dyed all the way through so you can't really see it. Let's do a quick demo test with five samples of vegetable tanned and undyed leather. Number one is a scrap that has been laying around for at least five years. Number two, same leather but cased and dried some time ago. Number three is a fresh piece of Herman Oak vegetable tanned carving leather. Number four, a goat skin sprayed with a thin water repellent. And finally number five, a veg tanned leather dipped in hot wax to add more body and strength to it. Some quick dabs with a dauber already show that some pieces suck up the dye in no time and others have a very slow penetration, such as on sample number five. Before we go on with the test, let's give it some time to dry, say about an hour. We can observe a slight lightening up of the color. So before moaning, I don't like it, it's too dark. 
Give it some time to dry. My question during the rubbing test is how well does the pigment stick to the leather? Against all expectation, the wax tip leather number 5 passes the test, unlike other samples, that leave a pigment residue on our white cloth. We may conclude that considering the wide range of parameters, constant testing of the various leathers we work with are a requirement, and that there are no absolute rules as to how well things can work out. Well, in those 10 minutes I only was able to give you a small glimpse about the vastness of all these different kinds of leathers they are. We're going to work with vegetable tanned, undyed, uncolored and untreated leather if possible. And uh, we may also understand by now that each hide is different and has its own characters. So it's not always going to behave the exact way as we expect. If you like this video, Share it with your friends, links are below as usual, and stay tuned for the next episodes where we finally are going to do some hands-on jobs of leather dyeing and coloring. Thank you. With all that, we still don't know what that toothbrush is for.